Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Zoo Box Goes to the Movies. Riding solo again this week, and uh, and I figured instead of talking about like any a movie in particular, I figured I'd talk about I don't know something that's been going on in the film world right now. Some discussion happening on if you're on Twitter and if you like movies, you know people talk, people share articles, people take quotes out of context or read headlines and make wild assertions about what that may mean you know and um yeah today we're gonna be talking about david fincher versus orson welles it's an interesting thing that's happening right now because so if you guys don't know david fincher has a movie called mank that he uh directed starring gary oldman about uh, Herman Mankiewicz, I believe his name is. Herman J. Mankiewicz, and they're kind of the... I guess you'd call it the fight for accreditation in some respect uh, surrounding Citizen Kane. It's one of these things that they were saying that, like, oh, this will this will blow up your, your preconceived notions about about Orson Welles and him being truly the master. Was he the auteur? Was it a one-man show? As we have all come to understand, right? Through the legend of Orson Welles. It's an interesting kind of little piece of film history because, you know, if you don't know, Orson Welles was kind of a little bit of a, a savant or a wonderkind, I guess you would call it. He got his, got his like, uh, his start, in this on the stage pretty young he was doing interesting kind of versions of shakespeare plays and uh, you know he did this like a, a noir detective version noir style noir detective styled version of uh, macbeth he did a version of othello that took place oh not Othello. i'm sorry hamlet that took place in like tribal africa um most famously probably uh, he had the mercury theater they would do like radio shows and uh, The War of the Worlds, a radio show that literally convinced large swaths of the population that we were being invaded by aliens. You know, if you guys don't know, if you don't know, it was uh, a deconstruction of the H.G. Wells story, and they presented it as a, as a news story. So it was like people on the ground going back into the studio you know, going back and forth like that and presented straight like that. They even had commercial breaks inside the play itself, um, which was actually pretty common for the time. If you've any ever listened to any old radio shows, like characters will just start vamping about like their favorite brands of cigarettes and stuff. Uh, so that was, it seemed normal that that would be happening. Um, and I don't believe they announced it as a, as a, ra no, they did. This is what happened. So they start like normal. It's so a Mercury Theater production, et cetera, et cetera. And then what happens is, excuse me, <laughs> little chime there. I turned down the music in my headphones. Um, a lot of people would just, you know, just like normal. When you grew up watching TV on cable and stuff, you might miss the first five minutes or whatever. So a lot of people just miss the opening of the show. And uh, it freaked people out. Honestly, it would be a cool thing. Probably, I'll probably do a live stream one day. Maybe we go and listen to the original broadcast. It would be kind of a lot of fun. But anyways, the reason I wanted to talk about this story in particular is because um, I'm a big fan of both of these directors. Orson Welles. I saw Citizen Kane when I was like 12 or 13. Interestingly enough, I rented it from the library. I was a young movie nerd. I had heard of Citizen Kane even by this time, even this young of an age. I was aware of Citizen Kane. I was aware of its kind of its stature. And uh, I really, really wanted to watch it. And I, the first time I saw it, even at such a young age, I was so blown away. I was so riveted by the movie. Uh, you know, at the time, obviously, I couldn't really put my finger on why. But even to this day, whenever I watch Citizen Kane... I'm still kind of blown away. I still kind of get wrapped up in it. It's one of those movies that if I see it on TV, well, back in the day when I would see it on TV or whatever, no matter what part it is at or whatever, I immediately drop the remote. And I got to watch the whole thing through. It's just 
one of those kind of movies for me. And um, so it's interesting because David Fincher had, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say super, it's, it's inflammatory stuff. So he gives this interview to Premiere Magazine, a French magazine, uh, you know, because he's out promoting the movie that's going to come out in a couple weeks, Mank, on Netflix. And, uh, and because of the nature of the movie and what the story is about, he talked about Orson Welles and the legacy of Orson Welles. And uh, there's a few choice quotes that were pulled by a few different outlets, kind of making the claim that he's like shitting on Orson Welles or dogging him or whatever. What makes it even more interesting is that, in my opinion, as a person who's kind of studied a lot of Orson Welles, read a lot of Orson Welles interviews, I own literally own books that are just Orson Welles interviews. Um, he wasn't too shy about commenting on his peers, even even living once. Um, he was a man who had an opinion, and he was kind of braggadocious a little bit, and he was uh, had a little bit of an ego. I think he thought he was a really good filmmaker, so he felt like comfortable commenting on the films of his peers. Actually, a contemporary person that does this quite a bit, especially in the past few years, is uh, Quentin Tarantino. The guy's always talking, <laughs> not talking smack, but we'll say giving some sort of constructive critiques of uh, the work of his peers. It's interesting. He did. He was on a couple episodes of the pod, the podcast called The Ringer, or The Ringer Network. What do they do? The Rewatchables. That's the show. And uh, they went down and like kind of picked a few of his favorite movies and just had kind of a a fun long form discussion. But you know. He was critical when he needed to be critical and he praised when he thought he should praise. It's a pretty, it's nice because it's so kind of just open and you don't really hear that a lot from artists about their peers. They just don't talk shit, which is a good thing in my opinion. You know, uh, you don't, you're probably going to run into this person at some point. You maybe even work with them at some point. You don't want to have those kind of things. Those are probably best kept private until you're an old man of letters and of I guess if the stories are true, Quentin Tarantino's on his way out. You know, he's going to do one or... Is there one more movie? I think that's the plan. He's going to do one more. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, unless he calls, like, a, a technicality and considers Kill Bill to actually just be one movie. Maybe he might do that. So maybe we'll get 11 Tarantino movies. But... Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, they pulled some quotes. You know, people kind of were freaking out on Twitter for some reason. And I wasn't aware up until a few months ago. Like, I guess Fincher, people are pretty critical of Fincher. Like, just his movies. You know, for being nihilistic and cold and uh, detached without humanity, you know. And I think that's kind of just his point of view. He does kind of seem like a little bit of a, a sardonic cold distant guy just in regular life kind of overly intellectual maybe even in a way that's not comes off as a smug I guess you could say not palatable to a lot of people you know I don't know I've always liked him <laughs> he's a formalist you know he's meticulous he's a meticulous proceduralist uh, both in front of the camera and behind the and behind the scenes, right? His stories tend to be about those kind of things, and his stories are often grapple with the notion of like, is there such a thing as kind of innate evil, innate darkness, or is it more contextual? Is it more circumstantial? That's kind of his whole his whole bag. His, all of his movies are kind of about that, to one degree or another. The one time that Fincher tried to do like a more of a sentimental film like a sentimental story the curious case of benjamin button it kind of fell completely fat flat he just does not i don't think he works well with that it's too the drama is too like what's the word i'm looking for inert because of i think like just the way he likes to focus on the filmmaking aspect of it so when he has something that's more procedural based you have something like zodiac right that's really all about the structure and the form and granted you know great performances all around he always gets usually gets good performances by everybody involved in his movies but they're a little bit more like intellectual a little more highbrow 
in terms of even though he's usually working in kind of almost exploitation genre stuff, he there is an air of pretentiousness about the way he goes about filmmaking, which, you know, I don't mind. Honestly, I don't need to like every fucking filmmaker. I don't need to like them personally. <laughs> I like things that are, you know, thought provoking. And if you've ever listened to the show before, if you've ever listened to zoo box goes to the movies, uh, I really love Stanley Kubrick. In fact, I'm in the midst of a, basically a filmography watch through with, uh, my good friend, big Paul. He's helping me out. We're watching the movies, discussing them. And Kubrick, I think, in a lot of ways, is very similar to Fincher. Um, I think there's maybe a little bit more humanity in Kubrick, like a smidge more. Um, not that he did. I mean, I'm trying to think, does Kubrick ever make like an overtly earnest movie? And an emotionally earnest movie? Not really. Fincher tried and he failed with Curious Case of Benjamin Button. It's just too, just not in his wheelhouse, in my opinion. In my opinion, that's like his worst movie. And I am including Alien 3 in that. Alien 3 is a failure because of like meddling, studio meddling. And him being a, a young director. You know, he comes from a music video background. You ever see Janie's Got a Gun? The Aerosmith music video? That's David Fincher. Actually makes sense if you've ever seen it. But anyways, now that we've kind of established a little bit about who these guys are, maybe where they're coming from, I think there's actually, they have some things in common, some similarities as filmmakers, as men, and their personal lives, very different, you know? Uh, Wells is kind of a big, warm presence. He likes to joke. He likes to play games. He likes to have fun. He likes to eat too much. He likes to drink too much. He likes to hang out with artists and musicians and actors and and uh, people into stagecraft, and he was always just kind of, his life was a whirlwind from the get-go. Never a dull moment for Orson Welles, even when it wasn't going well. Never a dull moment. Uh, but he's the kind of guy, you know, he got screwed, you know. Fincher's a company man. You know, Fincher works with big studios, and he's figured out how to work with them well, much to his credit, right? But Welles uh, was more of a, a rebellious figure. And Wells is a guy also that you didn't really know what to expect all the time. You you know, in hindsight, I think we're all, I would always give Orson Welles the benefit of the doubt. Uh, because there's still a, like maybe two or three Wells movies I've never seen. Like, I've never seen Chimes at Midnight. Um, is that the only one? I've seen The Trial. I'm trying to think of just like kind of the off the beaten path Wells movies. I think yeah, it might just be Chimes at Midnight. That might be the only one I haven't seen. But anyways, um, you could always be sure that it would be a good movie if he was, you know, left to his devices. It would be wildly different from one movie to the next. And you know, a couple years ago, his his uncompleted film, his uncompleted final film, was finished by friends and associates and uh, family members of the people involved in the production. They all came together and they put out The Other Side of the Wind, finally. Stars John Huston. Very interesting movie. Another one of these wild leaps forward in the same way that Citizen Kane was, you know. Because Forever, I think F for Fake was his final movie. And it's got a lot of similarities to F for Fake. It's kind of like this wild documentary style, um, really radical type of filmmaking. Where he's out just fucking shooting shit like crazy and the cameras are zooming in and out and all these crazy angles and was very unconventional because uh, he was up until the end of his life he was pushing the art form changing things so I'll say that as just a body of work and now Fincher's not dead yet and we don't know where Fincher was going to go but I think you kind of know what to expect when you watch a David Fincher movie I think you just there's just something there's a tone there's a style that's very like identifiable in a way, maybe that Wells was not always. Um, but anyways, we're going to get into some of these quotes. And then I got actually some uh, a video clip we're going to watch of Orson Welles kind of rebutting these statements from the past. It's a documentary about uh, Orson Welles from the BBC where there's a couple clips where he actually directly responds to some of the claims that David Fincher made. So if you're watching, 
this on YouTube, hello. If you're listening to the audio version, if you're just podcasting it, you can just listen along. It'll be fun. We're going to have a fun time today. And then at the end of it, maybe we're going to talk about uh, some of the, the problems Wells had in his career and the importance of film preservation. And I think a couple boutique labels that do good work uh, trying to keep kind of potentially forgotten movies alive. It's going to be fun. So let's hop over to the article. So this is from Playlist. They, uh, they pulled the quotes the most inflammatory quotes. I was trying to go find the the whole interview. Now, I'm not sh- I think it's out, but it's in French. I don't speak French. I guess I could go and do the Google Translate thing, but I don't know how accurate that would be. And sometimes a lot of like the way a person says something kind of makes all the difference, right? So, we're going to trust that the people at Playlist have a correct a correct um interpretation of what was said. So we'll just read through the article. It'll be fun. They set it up for us. When you make a film like Citizen Kane as your first first feature as a filmmaker, people are going to throw tons of acclaim your way. And that's exactly what happened with Orson Welles after the release of his masterpiece, which many still consider one of the greatest films of all time. However, according to David Fincher's Fincher, Welles is a talented filmmaker, but definitely not a film God. Like he's often regarded the shade. The shade has already begun. Drink, drink for Orson. This shady bitch. How dare he? Uh, speaking to the French outlet premiere, Fincher was asked about his thoughts on Orson Welles. This is clearly a question aimed at the filmmaker because of his upcoming feature, Mank, which details the struggles of Citizen Kane writer Herman J. Mankiewicz during the making of what would become an Oscar-winning hit. And while Phil Fincher is quick to applaud Welles for the clear talent the filmmaker had, the Mank director believes that Wells was above all a showman and a juggler with an, with this immense talent. So he's kind of almost in a weird way, kind of calling Orson Wells shallow, a phony to a certain degree, right? Like he's about the trickery, which is odd coming from him. Cause I think he's also kind of about the trickery to kind of get you to a certain place, a certain point of view. I don't know why he would, I don't know why, but I mean, it's not, it actually doesn't shock me that Fincher talks like this about Orson Welles, but I still kind of makes me chuckle. So here's another quote. Well, I think Orson Welles's tragedy lies in the mix between monumental talent and a filthy immaturity explained Fincher. Sure. There's a genius in citizen Kane who could argue, but when Wells says it only takes an afternoon to learn everything there is to know about the cinematography, Let's say this is the remark of someone who has been lucky to have Greg Toland around him to prepare the next shot. Greg Toland, damn it, an insane genius. Greg Toland was a genius, uh, a great cinematographer. A storied cinematographer even at the time that Citizen Kane was being made. And we're going to watch a clip in a little bit that directly answers this. The direct answer to this assertion. He continued... I say that without wanting to be disrespectful to Wells. I know what I owe him like I know what I owe Alfred Hitchcock, Ridley Scott, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, or Hal Ashby. But at 25, you don't know what you don't know. Period. Neither Wells nor anyone. It doesn't take anything away from him, and especially not his place in the pantheon of those who have influenced entire generations of filmmakers. But to claim that Orson Welles came out of nowhere to make Citizen Kane and that the rest of his filmography was ruined by the intervention of ill-intentioned people, it's not serious. And it is a misunderstanding and is under no, I'm sorry, and it is underestimating the disastrous impact of his own delusional hubris. See, now this is an assertion that seems a little ahistorical in my opinion. Like I said, I've been a Wells fan since I was 12 years old. I've read a lot about Wells, seen pretty much every documentary I could ever get my hands on about Orson Wells, even if they're redundant. I've listened to books about making the making of some of his movies. I even I read a book a few years ago about the other side of the wind before it was uh, coming out, before I even knew it was coming out. I was reading that book. And there is something... So there is some truth to the idea that uh, his his ability to make movies was hindered directly 
because of uh, making Citizen Kane and uh, bad blood between people in studios. Because I do think, you know, to give a little bit of credit here to Fincher, like he was a larger than life character. I think he liked what he liked and he wanted what he wanted. And I don't think he took no for an answer. But at the same time, that's kind of what makes his movie so impressive, you know? And there was always studio meddling. He always had to deal with shit. I mean, even in the 50s, he does a Touch of Evil with Charlton Heston. And that movie was uh, subject to tons of studio tinkering. I've never even seen the theatrical cut of Touch of Evil. I've only ever seen the... Uh, there's a version of it that came out in the 90s. Because uh, when Finch... Or not when Fincher, When Wells saw the edit that the studio had made, the edits to the movie, he wrote like 50 pages of notes, sent it to the studio... They archived it and didn't do anything with it, and they put the movie out. Uh, somebody restored the movie as close as they possibly could to his original intention based on those notes. I mean, this was something, I mean, he made a movie, um, a film version of The Merchant of Venice, which was very in line with a few other Shakespeare movies he had done. He did Othello. He did Macbeth. They're very, like, kind of stylized. You know, he'd film in, like, interesting, weird places in Europe. And uh, they're really cool movies. But he did Merchant of Venice, and uh, nobody's ever seen the movie because it got stolen off a truck. The negatives got stolen off the truck. There's the only thing I think that's surviving of that is uh, maybe one scene when he's, uh, when he's the Shylock towards the end of the play. I think that's the only thing that is remaining of it. Uh, and I don't think all of that, some of that you could chalk up to maybe, you know, he calls it delusional hubris, the difficulty maybe to work with them. I don't know. Maybe he was paranoid in some ways, but it does seem like there were other forces that kind of existed because of the content of Citizen Kane. Uh, you know, oh my God, I can't believe I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Because uh, <laughs> Citizen Kane is about a character called Charles Foster Kane. And it's based on a newspaper tycoon um, of the wildly wealthy newspaper tycoon. Um, I know his name and I'm for some reason just completely blanking on it. But well, you'll have to forgive me. It's late. I have to do these things late. Uh, so let's continue on in this article here. He continued. I say that without. Oh, no, I already read that part. What's the last? That's really, that's it? That's the two quotes in here? I read this before. I thought there was more. Anyways, let's read the last little bit here. There might be some of that scoff at what, there might be some that scoff at what Fincher said about Wells. However, in the decade, decades after Citizen Kane, when Wells struggled to live up to the acclaim of his feature debut, there were many that started to wonder how much of the success was due to the filmmaker and how much was due to his talented crew. In Fincher's eyes, that's the real question and points to the fact that Wells might have been talented, but maybe not as talented as he actually believed he was. If you want to watch Fincher's upcoming Mank, the film is in select theaters on November 13th before arriving on Netflix on December 4th. So yeah, shots fired. Yeah, I, I see, I disagree with the assertion that he struggled as like a filmmaker in his body of work to live up to live up to Citizen Kane. Like I said, he was a progressive filmmaker. He was always pushing the medium. The things he did for like in real, true independent filmmaking were incredible. I mean, go look at all of his movies um, from post Citizen Kane. You know, he did another big studio one because Citizen Kane was a big hit. People around the world, everybody loves Citizen Kane, right? So he does this other one called The Magnificent Ambersons. Now, this is another one. He's constantly fighting with the studio. They didn't like the original cut, but then he was in, like, South America shooting a documentary because that's the way he was. He was always off to the next thing. And the studio, I think, destroyed four reels <laughs> of the movie, went back, reshot everything, forced the people involved, many of them that were close, closely worked with Wells, were friends with Wells, were per, part of the Mercury Theater, and they were all under contract. There's nothing they could do, and they were trying to send him letters and all this crazy shit, just pleading with him, just please come back. They're, they're, they're trying to take the movie. And they did. And the version of Magnificent Ambersons that is out now um, is not a bad movie at all. And it definitely has a little bit of that Orson Welles touch, that studio Orson Welles touch. It's almost like a distinction between 
studio working wells and like independent filmmaker wells. So I disagree with this idea, this notion that somehow Orson Welles didn't live up to the expectations of Citizen Kane. And that feels like a reading of somebody that lived at the time, like a film critic from the f- fucking forties that uh, was just too stuck in like this, this need to have like some, something that he can make an assumption about, you know, Wells just wasn't that kind of filmmaker. He wasn't. And it's so, it's so bizarre in 2020 to have that perspective of Orson Welles and not kind of respect the man that he was and like what he did for the craft, the craft of filmmaking. It's crazy. It's wild. I, I, that is kind of, it's like a shocking editorial statement in this, these pull quotes among amongst the pull quotes. Um, I don't know. Now that I'm thinking about it, maybe Fincher does deserve <laughs> all this backlash. Maybe he does the little son of a bitch. All right. So let's mute the music. Some of that nice soft jazz music for a little bit. And we're going to go, we're going to check out my Twitter page here. I got them pulled up. And we'll read the quote, and then we'll read, uh, and then we'll listen to what Orson Welles, the man himself, had to say about the topics at hand. Okay, so here we go. So this is uh, David Fincher says when Welles says it only takes an afternoon to learn everything there is to know about cinematography. Cinematography. Puh. Let's say that this is the remark of someone who has been lucky to have Greg Tolan around him to prepare the next shot. Now, this is Orson Welles. The ghost of Orson Welles coming back, coming back in to uh, to set him straight. One day in the office they said there's a man called Toland waiting to see you. And uh, he was, of course, the leading cameraman. And he said, I want to make your picture. And I said, well, that's wonderful. Why? I don't know anything about movies. And he says, that's why I want to do it. He said, because... Oops. I think if you're left as alone as much as possible, we're going to have a movie that looks different. I'm tired of working with people who who know too much about it. We came to a moment in the first week of shooting where, uh, or no, the second week, where I suddenly was told by somebody that it was not the job of the director to do all the lighting. Up to then, I'd been doing all the lighting with Tolan behind me, balancing it and so on, but saying, don't tell anybody, you see. Then I had to go and apologize to him and everything. Then, then, then another awful, awful moment came when I didn't understand directions, and Tolan showed me how that worked. And I said, well, God, there's a lot of stuff here I don't know. And he said, there's nothing I can't teach you in three hours. And that's when I said that which has been taken as a, as a very um, pompous statement that I learned everything in three hours. It was Tolan's idea that anybody can learn it in three hours and that he taught it to me in three hours. Everything else is if you're any good or not. Wells and Tolan never claimed to have invented new techniques. What they did was to combine existing ones into a virtuoso catalogue of effects, film sets with complete ceilings, overlapping sound, deep focus photography, expressionist lighting. And if you doubt Wells' own contribution to the look of Kane, as some critics have, look first at the lighting designs for his 1937 theatre production, Julius Caesar. This is three years before he went to Hollywood. And here's the sequence in the Thatcher Library from Citizen Kane. Pages 83 to 142. So there you go. See? I mean, not only did he... uh, was he completely aware of Tolan's presence? He credits him with being a mentor and a teacher and patient with him. Now, it doesn't sound like a guy who's like uh, some arrogant asshole. Uh, but like he even well says, though, you know, he was kind of taken out of context, maybe, because uh, he got it from Toland. And the fact that David Fincher made Mank and didn't know that, I guess, you know, that's confirmation bias. I don't know. You know, just kind of going, I don't know, just uh, not looking actually into the other side of the story. You think he would just be steeped in everything. 
maybe in fairness to Fincher, he was steeped, steeped in Mankiewicz's stuff in that story because that's the point of view he wanted to present. So maybe it was more methodical him not ch- him choosing not to look into uh, Orson Welles. Um, but who knows? And if you guys don't know, uh, Tolan totally has a credit. He has a credit in the in Citizen Kane, so it's not like he was. And because, you know, Wells also has a credit for photography in Citizen Kane. So, you know, it doesn't seem like that. Okay, so here's the next one. David Fincher. To claim that Orson Welles came out of nowhere to make Citizen Kane and the rest of his filmography was ruined by the interventions of ill-intentioned people, it's not serious and it is underestimating the disastrous impact of his own delusional hubris. Well, here we go. We got another, we got another, uh, piece from this documentary let's see what uh see what old wells has to say for himself the real point of ambitions everything that is any good in it is that part of it which was really just a preparation for the decay of the ambitions you'll never see that part of the film these stills are all that remain of three or four missing reels the film was cut by the studio in wells absence at least 45 minutes of his version has totally disappeared. It was thought by everybody in Hollywood while I was in, in um, South America that uh, it was too downbeat, famous Hollywood word at the time, downbeat. So it was all taken out, but it was the purpose of the movie. Wells has expressed enormous bitterness over the cuts that were made in it. Well, I'm sorry about that, because I was involved in all the cuts, but it was one of those circumstances that couldn't be helped. He was in South America uh, making a film for the government to help our war effort uh, and that good neighbor policy we had with South America. He had been sent to Brazil to do that. Uh, He was not up here when we previewed the film. After we got it all finished, uh, we had sent him a print, and he had some some changes he wanted made, which we made, but then we took the picture out for preview, and uh, the audience just wouldn't sit still for it. Consequently, we, we did cut about 25 or 30 minutes of the original film, and we had to make two or three or four new bridge scenes tied together, and there was a new ending shot. Set in a hospital corridor where Agnes Moorhead and Joseph Cotton seem all set to walk into the sunset. There's no scene in a hospital, and nothing like that ever happened in the story. I held the preview cards in my hand, which I didn't tell you, and uh, there were these terrible reactions to the picture that said that, you know, everybody who made it ought to be hung, hanged. And the other uh, five to 10 to 20 that said it was only the greatest movie ever made that they'd ever seen. I think they were probably close to the truth. It probably was uh, among the five most important films made, I think, in America, ever. And uh, it's, I think, the greatest artistic tragedy in the movies that that particular film was so mutilated because you barely get a a sense of what it was. Excuse me. Uh, Yeah, and that's kind of the story of Orson Welles' life. Things like that just constantly happening to him. You know? So when Fincher says something like that, it comes from this weird place of is it arrogance? Is that what it is? Is it arrogance? Is it ignorance? A lack of empathy? <laughs> Robot Fincher? You know? Um, he also had some other choice words for a few other things. I mean, we can take a peek at those as well. Uh, Fincher did. He's out talking about the modern movie, movie landscape, and he talks shit about the Joker. David Fincher... Joker, just since we're talking. <laughs> Let me see here. <laughs> I have not, I didn't prepare for this. This is just kind of a spur of the moment thing. David Fincher says Joaquin Phoenix's Joker was a betrayal of the, men- of the mentally ill. Oh my goodness. Let's see here. Nobody would have thought that they had a shot at a giant hit with Joker. Had the Dark Knight not been a mass massive as it was, Fincher said, indeed the Dark Knight also racked up more than one billion for the studio Warner Brothers, but even Joker bested it. Um, oh, I'll put it up on screen for funsies, so you can keep me 
Keep me straight. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Making up. Fincher quotes. Uh, I don't think anyone would have looked at that material and thought, yeah, let's take Taxi Driver's Travis, Travis Bickle and King of Comedy's Rupert Pumpkin. Two characters played by Robert De Niro, who also appeared in Joker, and conflate them, then trap him in a betrayal of the mentally ill and trot it out for billions of dollars, Fincher said. <laughs> Did he see the movie? Well, that's it. That's the quote. There she, there she is. There's the quote, everybody. I don't see... I'm not actually a huge fan of Joker, and a lot of it is... Be, not for the thesis of what he's saying, but just for the, I thought it was kind of tired. I thought it was a little hacky. I thought it was too, way too derivative for its own good. Um, you know, it, it is very much so a mixture of the King of comedy and taxi driver. Uh, and that's not some, that's not even controversial. Todd Phillips, Todd Phillips himself, the director totally cost to that totally says that well he's not he doesn't say they're a ripoff but he says heavily inspired heavily inspired by that version of new york that tone of taxi driver um and then having kind of the comic tragedy the comic tragedy of uh the uh the king of comedy two of, of actually my favorite movies uh, so when I watched Joker, I was just kind of like, yeah, it's okay. It's very pedantic in my view. It's very just kind of simple, almost too simple for what it's trying to discuss. But I think this idea that this is a betrayal of the mentally ill. No, I mean, that's not the focus of the movie. The focus of the, it's very like current year Joker because it is kind of in, in some weird way about um, socialized health care, for lack of a better way to put it. It's how does society writ large the government people treat people with mental illness and with problems and joker joaquin phoenix character becomes kind of a manifestation of the frustration and rage that people have forgotten people have you know travis bickle's not really like that he's more of a sociopath like you know that's not really Travis Bickle's bag. Um, Rupert Pumpkin of King of Comedy is also a sociopath. Like, you know, when you watch, it makes for a great double feature. If, you've ever, if you're ever bored, watch Taxi Driver and The King of Comedy back to back. Uh, because they are very similar movies. And those main characters, both played by Robert De Niro's, are just kind of bizarro mirrors of each other. And uh, it's it's fascinating. So I think like the idea that like it was it was like this the scheme to make a ton of money. I guess you know if you want to be cynical, making that calling that movie Joker is cynical because it's not the Joker. It's not the Joker. It's sorry, it's not. You keep, Joker doesn't exist without Batman. It, and it's and it's it, you know I guess you could chalk it up. Oh, it's like an Elseworlds thing. It's one of these alternate storylines these alternate things that they do sometimes in comic books but i don't know i mean that seems like a stretch to me that's just my opinion though it's not a popular opinion for people my age most people i know my brothers my friends like everybody really loves the joker and i think a lot of people get attached to joaquin's performance which is a good performance don't get me wrong. It's not a performance I, I dislike or think is bad or anything. I really love Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, but if it was, I think I would have rather him be nominated for something like You Were Never Really There. Or You Were Never Really Here, rather. This movie that came out, I think, in 2018. It's on Amazon Prime. You should check it out. Where he's like a, it's like a artsy-fartsy hitman movie. About child sex trafficking. Very very prescient, right? A lot of Q material there, you know? But anyways, so that was fun. Checked out some stuff. Looked into some things, but just relative to what we were talking about with Orson Welles, right? And kind of how his his career was hampered, maybe. Maybe by a little bit of his youthful hubris when he was younger. Maybe, maybe because of what happened with Citizen Kane. 
I thought the guy's name would come to me. Uh, let's see here. Who is Charles Foster King? <laughs> King. Super. Let's see. Let's look it up real quick here, huh? Oh my God! How did I forget his fucking name? William Randolph Hearst. That that's crazy. I'm sorry, guys. Fucking, I'm a phony. I've just been outed as a phony. I've never actually even heard of Orson Welles before today. I was just reading all afternoon, and I just, you know, I, I discovered him today. So you got me. You got me. Yeah, William Randolph Hearst, the, uh, you know, Chicago. So this is a couple of it. In Chicago tycoon Samuel Insull and Harold McCormick. Well, the only person I ever heard was William Randolph Hearst. Maybe it's because it was the way Hearst reacted to Citizen Kane. I don't know, you know? There's lots of theories about what he would do or who he contacted, and it went on for years. Like, his estate kept going after Orson Welles after he died. Crazy shit, man. Movies disappearing off of trucks. Reels disappearing off of trucks. Nobody's ever seen them. But, and this is something that I think uh, happens all the time, right? We lose movies. Movies get lost. They get lost to time sometimes. Especially with like things like format changes, rights lapsing. Sometimes the movies themselves, like especially older movies from back in the day, they just kind of disappear. Or maybe they were kind of obscure to begin with. Or, you know, they didn't make a splash when they first came out. So they were kind of just forgotten. The only people that really remember it are the people that saw it on TV or, or saw it in the theater when it came out, you know? Lots of movies like that. But. There's a few, um, like everybody might know, I don't know, if you listen to the show, you know, I am a, a movie collector. I enjoy collecting Blu-rays and uh, 4Ks and movie memorabilia and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I've been really getting into uh, boutique stuff recently because it's been a doorway to introduce to me to movies that I had never really heard of because they just didn't have cultural impact in a way. But that doesn't mean they weren't good. But they're movies that could be very easily just forgotten to time. You know? Um, something like The Internecine Project, starring James Coburn. I had never heard of this movie up until a few weeks ago. Never even heard of it. And Kino Lorber, Kino Lorber Studio Classics, uh, they do a really great job kind of getting these movies. Sometimes they restore them, sometimes they don't. You know, it depends, I think, if they have access to the original negatives and whatnot. Um, and they put them on a Blu-ray. Because something like this, it probably didn't even come out on DVD. And that happens all the time. There are still movies that have never, uh, have never gone from VHS to DVD. That's a thing, you know? And studios like this are important because they hunt down these things. And they're not, you know, they're not pretentious like... Like the Criterion Collection. Like, I listen, I really love the Criterion Collection. I do. I think they're an important institution. I think Janice Films does great work. Okay? I really do. I sincerely mean that as a film fan. But they are, quote, like going to try to maintain the legacies of, quote, unquote, important movies. Like, we need people out there bringing the Internison Project <laughs> out there. You got to maintain it. Somebody's got to do it. And Keenan Lorber has stepped up, right? Or like uh, the Macaulay Culkin movie from the 90s, The Good Son. Now, this was kind of a big movie when it came out. I remember it was in my life. But I don't even know if that movie came out. It must have come out on DVD. It had to have come out on DVD. I don't know, though. Or something like, um, you know, Park Chan-wook's Thirst. A more contemporary movie, but stateside in the United States, in the U.S. anyways, the region A, uh, it had never gotten a proper Blu-ray release. It only been, had been released on uh, DVD, which I own. I own it. Uh, it never, it never went to Blu-ray, and they just like I think it was this year they put this out. You know, like it's going to help the film have a longer life it's going to give people more chances to find it um what's another one i got here and this is another this i haven't even never even seen this i just like but it, i never i had not heard of it either the reincarnation of peter proud okay 
Like that's I'm just the the plot synopsis was super fascinating. Um, it's from an era of movies I also kind of enjoy. <laughs> but Kino Lorber, like I said, they're not out there trying to get like these like important or art films or whatever because they'll release things like Thirst, uh, Deep Rising, Stephen Summers movie, the guy uh, who directed the original or the first two Mummies, The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. You remember those? Remember Van Helsing? <laughs> He directed those, but this is where he cut his teeth with Deep Rising. And something like Deep Rising, I mean, who the fuck cares about Deep Rising? Well, apparently me and Keenan Lorber do. And just making these things available so that they'll live on a little bit longer. You know, this is, goes back to, uh, I did a live stream by myself, like just a short one a few weeks ago. Kind of talking about the importance of archivists and even things like piracy. You know, the digital age has given us this opportunity, right? Uh, what the hell's that movie? There's a movie that's never... Meet the Meet the Applegates? We're going to do this on the fly. Yeah, Meet the Applegates, right? It's only... It's never went to DVD. It was always... It only... The last place it was on anything was uh, VHS, right? But somebody... Somebody took the time to rip the VHS and put it online. Like, it will have some type of life. It's, I mean, Meet the Applegates is not a good movie. I'm not saying it's like a great movie or anything like that. Chill out, everybody. Um, we'll take a look at it. So you can see at home. Meet the Applegates. You remember this movie? I remember it because it used to be on HBO all the time. And every once in a while, even though we were poor, we would intermittently have movie channels at my house. You know, you get it for a month, watch a bunch of stuff, get rid of it, et cetera, et cetera. But that, this would be probably completely lost because, you know, who knows if anybody's ever going to pick up the rights to meet that, meet the Applegates. But, but some beautiful industrious pirate out on those digital seas riding high, he, they saw fit to do it. I don't know if it's a, a, a man or a woman. Probably a dude, though. I'm going to say it's probably a dude. Probably some gross 4chan nerd. Yeah. Pretty disturbing stuff, everybody. But if those people are patriots, okay? They're film patriots. Those people like that rule. But yeah, you know, and just to support them, I would say this is not a, a commercial or anything. I don't have any stake in Kino Lorber, but Kino Lorber is a cool, cool ass studio. You know, look for the spine. Okay, it looks like that. All the spines look like that. I mean, Kino Lorber put out uh, a remastered versions of Coal Shack or the Night Stalker and the Night Strangler, the Coal Shack TV movies from the 70s. I mean, they're doing shit like that. You know, I, I had like this bum ass MGM DVD of it, which, hey, credit that it was even on DVD, but it was like one of those double sided DVDs. Fucking shit drives me crazy. It just look like garbage. Look like hot garbage. But Kino Lorber took it. Treated it with some respect. Put it out there. Okay. So I would say go support them. And they have really great sales. Kino Lorber always has really great sales. I don't think they just had a sale. So I doubt they have one right now. But. Let's we'll pull up their website for them. Give them a little plug here. Kino Lorber Classic. Yeah, they put out Hannibal. They put out a 4K of Hannibal. The, uh, you know, the cannibal, the cannibal movie, Hannibal the Cannibal. I'll try to fix this on the fly here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've done stuff with a lot of spaghetti westerns, but look at all these kind of movies they put out. Look at these kind of just crazy weird stuff that they do. They put out the Emmanuel movies. Oh, man, if you don't know what Emmanuel is, good for you. <laughs> Becky Sharp, never heard of it. Far From Heaven, a movie from the 90s, but another one, you know? It was actually a, kind of a big deal at the time, putting out the Outer Limits on Blu-ray, the original Outer Limits. I mean, come on. Come on, everybody. I mean, check this stuff out. They just put out Eager Sanction. I've never even heard of that. The Beguiled, actually a great movie. Amazon Women on the Moon. Play Misty for me, another great movie. 
doing good work doing good work and what i like about them a lot of the times they're putting out stuff they're putting out stuff that is not available somewhere else or you can't get in another format now there's a few other boutiques that i do also enjoy that i also like but they more or less put out movies that uh, you could probably find other places or you know they don't have exclusive rights to them things like uh you know like a scream factory this is my copy of Bubba Hotep. Uh, they, you know, sometimes they do transfers, sometimes they don't. They're not, they're mostly, you know, Scream Factory is exclusively genre stuff. They're a subsidiary of Shout Factory. Uh, but a lot of the times, the movies they put out are widely available other places. They may have a new transfer. They might have special features on it. Uh, you know, usually they, Scream Factory kind of disappoints me a lot of times because their special features are, to me, in some respects, are a little lazy. Like, they just go and film a bunch of talking head interviews. And you just watch, like, a plain interview for, like, 20 minutes. It's actually very, like, YouTube era in <laughs> some respects. You know, back in the day, back when I was growing up. And studios were, would do this themselves. Like, studios actually, you know, Paramount. They have, like, a Paramount Classics line now. Uh, they're starting to kind of get into this business of like, oh, maybe we should respect our, our catalog. Warner Brothers Archive is another one. Um, but they're, most of the time they put out bare bones movies. Like they're not going out and doing extra special features and stuff. Because back in the day, um, a lot of the time, the first time I would see some of these classics, uh, I would be when I bought them. And a lot of times it would be because there would have been like a 10th or 15th anniversary edition and they'd you know, be loaded with commentaries and documentaries and all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, they don't really even do that anymore. Even contemporary movies when they come out. It's almost like, I'd say like 50% of the time there's not even like an audio commentary on it. Which is too bad. Because me as a person, you know, even if I didn't like a movie, an audio commentary on there might sway me like i'm not gonna say i'm gonna go out and buy it day one or whatever but if i see it on sale like a black friday sale or something i might check it out i might pick it up just to listen to that audio commentary because i'm a film fan i like to hear what filmmakers are thinking even when they make movies that i don't particularly love you know like case in point i bought knives out because it was five dollars i did not like knives out but has the audio commentary on it. <laughs> and I know that Ryan Johnson is going to walk me through his process and what he thought. Like, you know, The Last Jedi is a movie I, I cannot fucking stand. I've realized I'm not a huge, I'm not that big of a Star Wars fan, honestly, over the past few years. But anyways, beyond that, like, I listened to that audio commentary, though. And I was fascinated by it. Like, he does explain what he was thinking. Why he thought what he was doing was right. What led him to make certain decisions. Why he thought his point of view on the story and the characters was interesting. I think he was wrong. <laughs> but. I like to know what the actual argument is. What is the actual discussion of somebody that I disagree with. I don't need somebody to. I don't want to be in like a bubble. I don't want even when it comes to art. Like I don't want to be in that. I don't want to be like that. It's just not my bag, you know? I'm cool guy, Sean. Okay, I'm out here. I'm doing God's work. Out here educating myself for no one. Maybe my son will. Maybe he'll benefit from it someday. Maybe he'll, he's going to be, you know, maybe he'll be the next Orson Welles. You know, like, dad kind of failed and decided to just be a movie nerd. But maybe with all of this enveloping his life maybe he'll uh, he'll grow up to be the next orson wells i'm glad that orson wells though has come back into kind of the zeitgeist over the past few years for such a long time growing up uh because you talk to like you know movie nerds when i was a teenager and stuff and they'd always be dismissive of like citizen kane i never understood why i never got it and I would hear like adults say the same thing. And I was just like, you know, because they're like, yeah, you know, it's one of the greatest movies ever made. Whatever. It's like because people treat movies like that, that are kind of these, that are put up on a pedestal like that, almost like antiques. And they don't ever really pull them off the shelf 
They don't like examine them. They don't take them seriously, you know, anymore. They're just like, yeah, it's great. It's like the Mona Lisa or something. You know, they're like, yeah, it's a, it's a great painting. Very interesting. <laughs> and then they just walk on. They keep walking, right? Without being intensely critical of it or really deep diving into it or anything like that. You know, obviously Citizen Kane is taught in film schools and stuff. So maybe that's where it comes from. It's like this this youthful rebellion be like, oh, fuck Citizen Kane, man. I had to learn about that shit in school. Citizen Kane's for nerds, man. Give me some John Cassavetes. Give me something real. You know? But yeah, like I said, I'm glad that people have kind of brought Orson back and have made his films relevant again. Because I think a lot of them, a lot of them, most of his career... He was way ahead of the curve. Way, way ahead of the curve. I mean, Citizen Kane was... Nobody made a movie like Citizen Kane again in, for fucking 40 years. I mean, just the craftsmanship alone of that movie, the inventiveness of it. Making kind of this rote and obvious story, like, very dynamic and powerful and full of symbolism and metaphor and uh visually you know he did it all through the visual trickery him and toland out there fucking rocking and rolling what a cool guy what a cool guy you know it's sad it's sad you know orson wells is kind of one of these more recent living examples of somebody that didn't really get the respect culturally until after he was dead you know it's sad. It's sad. It bums me out. I mean, I think he knew that people, like, you know, the art community respected him. Serious Sinius respected him. But at large, the culture at large, you know, they knew about him from, like, game shows. Or doing bit parts and shitty movies. You know, because he was so into what he did, like, he would go be in shitty movies so that he could finance his own projects. But he would do fucking filming himself in his house. Like with uh, reciting passages from Moby Dick. I think there's a, there's a documentary. I think I, I might have mentioned this earlier. Um, called The Lost Movies of Orson Welles. And that was one of them. He wanted to make like a Moby Dick movie. Or do something with Moby Dick. And it seemed like he was doing something interesting. So what he did was he had like a, like a, a bowl of water. Or a big... Little, little mini pool of water put a piece of glass at the bottom of it shined a light in that so like the waves the, the kind of slow splashing of the water would kind of reflect on him and there's like a blue black, black background and he's he's reading from Moby Dick and it's awesome honestly I wish he there was just a version of the entire book like that I would sit there for fucking 15 hours and just watch Orson Welles in that locked off shot just reading Moby Dick someday or the whole thing the whole way through <laughs> I would do that I'd do that someday I'd do it now probably doesn't exist but yeah it's almost like you know it's it's interesting like you know with having the other side of the wind come out it's almost uh, it's almost sad it's almost because it is the the final thing right because there's always sort of this abstract notion of a this other Orson Welles movie out there someday that like oh maybe we'll get to see it someday maybe we'll get to see his final project because they were talking about finishing the other side of the wind for like 20 years like I heard about it when I was a kid and all growing up and uh, Pete Bogdanovich his friend and filmmaker also one of the stars of the other side of the wind um, was has been heavily involved in that in a long time. Pete Dog Bogdanovich, I think, is a weird guy. I'm not actually a huge fan of his movies. He did like these New York lifestyle comedy movies with Sybil Shepherd, and then ends up that's a long story. But anyways, <laughs> kind of a, I don't I don't know. I watched a documentary about him. It kind of turned me off to him. But as in terms of his work as uh, an archivist and keeping kind of the spirit of something alive and keeping keeping that lane open for something like the other side of the wind to be to be completed someday 
is really awesome. And there's not a lot of people, I think, that are like that. Like, you know, David Fincher is not like that. He's not out there trying to preserve the history and legacy of cinema, you know? He's an immediate artist and he's doing it for himself, like most artists do, right? You know, David Fincher is not going to go star in a shitty movie so he can make his low-budget piece in his backyard. Like, he's not going to do that. Would Orson Welles would. Orson Welles would fucking do that. And that's kind of the most important thing I think you can have as a takeaway from all this. Orson Welles would, everybody. He'd do it. Didn't have time for your bullshit. What a guy. What a guy. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to know more about Zoobox, there's a bunch of links in the description for Facebook, for Instagram, for my Twitter, for my brother Dan's Twitter. Also, if you'd like to make a suggestion for either the daily movie reviews or something to talk about uh, for the big show, for Zoobox Goes to the Movies, let me know. I will, uh, I'll put it on the list because we're going to be doing this for a long time, everyone. And the more material I have, the less thinking I have to do, if somebody can make a decision for me, the better, as far as I'm concerned. All right, everybody, you have a great day or night or whenever. You just be you and groove. <laughs>